Heart transplant in the modern era in this country started in 1994, as Dr. Prashant mentioned uh, in the All India Institute. And uh, we did our first transplant here in 1996. And till the year 2009, the progress was slow because of a lack of well-organized donor program. And even now, over 80% of the heart transplants done in India happen in this city because of a very well-organized donor program. Over the last four or five years, there has been a substantial uh, uh, increase in awareness about organ donation. And all the circles you see are the states which have an active uh, organ don donor program. What is striking is the eastern part of the country, still uh, the organ donation is not taking place. As a consequence, there's been a steady rise in both the number of donors and the number of transplants done. And uh, <clears throat> in our own unit, we have had a significant rise in the number of transplants over the last four or five years. We do about an average of 80 transplants a year, and this year I think we have done already around 65. Uh, to put things in perspective, the, uh, uh, according to the International Society of Heart Lung Transplant Database, the number of units worldwide which do more than 50 transplants a year is in single digits. Uh, the Intermax as a method of uh, <clears throat> quantifying or uh, the degree of heart failure has been spoken to by the previous speakers. And it's important because the outcomes for, say, transplantation, this is a study from Spain where um, because of the generous availability of donor organs, they could transplant patients even if they are in uh, Intermax 1 or in cardiogenic shock. As you can see, the brown and blue bars are Intermax 1 and 2, and the mortality is quite high if you do it on very sick patients. And the same thing was true in the initial trials of uh, HeartMate 2. So coming to the current realities for heart failure patients seen in our surgical practice, the majority of patients who are grieved for transplantation are very sick into max one, two, or three. Uh, most of them have a creatinine, which is more than two. Several patients are on dialysis, significantly elevated bilirubin is common, and high pulmonary vascular resistance is another thing you have to deal with. Unfortunately, HeartMate 2, HeartWare, HWAD, and HeartMate 3, the, the long-term LVAD devices in the market are not of great use for us as a bridge to transplant because of the enormous cost involved. So we had to overcome a lot of challenges before establishing a successful program. And I should list a few of them. The most important thing was the waiting list mortality. This is a slide from, the, from 31st December 1999. I had done this transplant on that day. The date is important because that was supposed to be the Y2K year when computers were supposed to crash. You can see the child with the ascites, she had a previous sending repair for TGA. The operation went well, but she died two months later. So clearly she needed to have been referred. In those days, of course, we didn't have a VAD. The humble mildew on bottle <coughs> is the commonest bridge we use with which we send patients home while they are awaiting an organ. But we have um, used ECMO extensively uh, as a bridge to transplant because of its relatively uh, low cost in the Indian context. Our first experience was this 34-year-old woman from Delhi with severe bioventricular dysfunction who was crashing. And she was put on ECMO and 10 days later we got an organ. And she did very well, five years post-transplant. She had a VO2 max of 42 and she was skiing in the slopes of Gulmarg. She died after five and a half years. She had one episode of rejection, which uh, got treated completely. She developed tuberculosis of the parotid gland, uh, which was treated locally, but she was not started on ATT. She was not, for some reason, she was not compliant and eventually died of full-blown tuberculosis. Uh, it can be also used in children, like this young girl with a single ventricle with severe ventricular dysfunction who had a cardiac arrest, resuscitated with ECMO, and uh, she's smiling at the top left because she heard news that her organ is available. And you can see in the bottom right how quickly they regain their weight. We also used ECMO in patients with severe RV dysfunction with, uh, who under, with severe pulmonary hypertension who underwent lung transplantation. ECMO, unfortunately, is not a long-term solution. Uh, you need to get an organ within two, two, maximum three weeks. And if we don't get an organ, we convert them to short-term VADs. These function for a month according to the FDA approval, but we can push them on up to three months. They are relatively inexpensive. They cost around four to five lakhs. And um, uh, we use the ventricular uh, apex as the input for the uh, inflow into the, can into the pump. If it's full of thrombus, we use the left atrial appendage. And uh, with this, the patients are stabilized. The end organ function is better. They can't be discharged home. 
and when the uh, urea and creatinine are normal and they're making good urine, they undergo an elective transplant and they do very well. We have also used them in children as young as this, and the youngest we have done is an eight-month-old kid who underwent a successful transplant, including a pair of siblings like this who both had uh, were on Centrimac at the same time. I can, I can only imagine the plight of the parents having two children, both on a Centrimac, then of course they fortunately got a good organ and they successfully went to transplant. Uh, <clears throat> we also use ECMO extensively uh, in post-operative settings when the donor is not ideal. This young two-year-old child with restrictive cardiomyopathy with severe pH had a young uh, donor but had um, the right ventricle was struggling, so she was supported in ECMO for 12 days and eventually completely recovered. Uh, it's also used when the donor is uh, heart is dysfunctional, like this an eight-year-old girl with cardiomyopathy. <laughs> And uh, pediatric donors are rare, so but, uh, a young donor, by and large, it's because of stress cardiomyopathy. The ventricle would recover, so we put it in, and uh, at the end of the operation, the heart ventricle was not beating, but when you continue the ECMO in two days' time, the ventricle completely recovers. The other challenge we had to overcome was inner city traffic, and um, uh, so we started the concept of using a police escort as a green corridor, and uh, eventually I'm glad to uh, note that this has become popular all over the country, it's now being extensively used. Transportation from other cities is still a problem because air ambulances are expensive, uh, they're not available, and they're exorbitantly charged. So we started using commercial aircraft, so we created a separate team to um, classify airports according to Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. And we have done, as of date, close to 120 airliftings, mostly commercial aircrafts and with some uh, air ambulances. The other innovation we had to do was protocol biopsies. An American protocol is 14 biopsies in the first year. Each biopsy in our hospital costs 85,000 rupees. That's a lot of money. And apart from which, the um, the, the logistics of getting the patients to come from different parts of the country was formidable. So we restricted the biopsies to two, one at the end of the month uh, before discharge, one at the end of the year. And we showed there was no difference in outcomes with a 91% one-year survival rate. This was published in the ISHLT. We also had to tailor, ma uh, tailor make the, uh, the immunosuppressive dosages uh, uh, significantly to suit our population. As of date, I think uh, we've done a little more. Out of 256 transplants we've done or as of date, uh, roughly 73% are alive at five years. These actually are, every single patient is followed up in the series, and these compare very favorably with what is published in the ISHLT. Um, pediatric transplants, uh, we have done about 81, and uh, the five-year survival actually is better at 82%. Uh, the one issue with pediatric transplants is uh, if the donor weight is more than three times the recipient weight, sometimes they have excessive cardiac output with high blood pressure and sometimes can have a cerebral bleed. Transplant following a VAD, uh, I find that HeartMate 2 is easier to transplant as compared to HVAD, where especially in pediatric populations, the, the VAD is positioned inside the pleural cavity and the lung can get badly stuck and sometimes you end up doing a lower lobectomy. One of the issues we have faced is the donor coronary artery disease uh, because of the high incidence of premature atherosclerosis in India. This young woman had a donor heart from somebody in the 30s and uh, routine angiogram at three months at the time of biopsy showed a triple vessel disease which she underwent stenting. We had now, now that our follow-up is now going to six years, we're starting to, be, to see coronary vasculopathy. We use IVOS routinely every year, uh, angiogram with IVOS, and this ch child got stented. Uh, we've had several challenging situations in complex anatomy and congenital heart disease. Uh, and we've done, I think, 22 patients with complex congenital heart disease, out of which 20 have survived. Uh, we have significant exp uh, experience with using ECMO as a, from, to resuscitate from cardiac arrest. Uh, these are patients who have had a cardiac arrest inside the hospital while awaiting a transplant. And out of 23 cardiac arrest, arrest resuscitated with ECMO, supported for up to six weeks, 17 have survived the transplant and alive at one year, actually. These are good results. Uh, we also used ECMO to bridge to LVAD, five and three of them have survived. And this experience also extends to children where out of 13 ECMOs used for cardiac arrest, 10 ended up getting a transplant and seven are long-term survivors. Um, to give a few examples of what is possible in today's era, a 58 year old, this is the first LVAD to be done in this country and uh, is walking for the first time after nine months. And one year he became a grandfather, and two years he's back to eating and drinking with a paunch. 
So the behavior doesn't change by just because you change the heart or the uh, put in a van. A general surgeon with an LVAD has gone, gone back to operating five kids a week. Uh, the first HVAD in this country uh, was admitted with cardiac arrest with uh, recurrent VT. He's back to work. Uh, and uh, we also used uh, LVAD in patients with cardiomyopathy, like this young woman from Delhi who had a cardiac arrest, bridged with ECMO and re recovered. A uh, 70-year-old man with VT storm uh, had a C CPR, the battery drained out, was an ECMO, had an HVAD, recovered. And we've used HVADs, I mean LVADs, in patients with high creatinine with severe heart failure, where they are referred for a combined heart and kidney, and we put in the LVAD first, and some of them the kidney recovers because the cardio renal uh, element is dominant, and this patient actually was on dialysis for two years on CPD, recovered uh, with a creatinine of 1.8 and is off dialysis. This is an example uh, I, uh, of typical patient that all of us would see day to day. 70-year-old man, anteroceptal myocardial infarction, uh, late stenting. He was continuing to be in pulmonary edema, three weeks on ventilation, he was referred uh, with, on IABP with renal failure, creatinine 4.8, blood pressure 60. We put him on ECMO followed by VAD and three weeks later we successfully transplanted him. He's actually a photographer for National Geographic and he's gone home. So with current technology, um, good outcomes are possible. The oldest transplant we have done successfully is 82. He's alive and doing well four years later. I'll skip these. Um, uh, just to highlight, uh, sometimes uh, patients in ECMO get organs which are not the best, but um, like the, the echo on the left is the uh, preoperative echo of this very sick child. The echo on the right is the organ we got, significant ventricular dysfunction. Uh, eight units refused this organ because the ventricle was not normal. We went and put it in. Um, the, space, the ventricle recovered and it was looking good. And on the third week, we noticed severe right ventricular dysfunction with free TR, and we took him back for a biopsy, which was normal, and written angiogram. The donor had severe coronary artery disease. And we ended up stenting it, and I ended the stent, uh, three stents, the child arrested. So it, it was an adult heart put into a five-year-old child. We put in three stents. He was again resuscitated with ECMO for two days and completely recovered his ventricular function. <clears throat> The functional outcomes have been excellent. Uh, this child to my left uh, was in preoperative ECMO, and I found her, uh, somebody called out my na name loudly. She was trekking uh, at an altitude of 6,000 feet in Munnar uh, climbing. So that kind of functional outcomes are possible. This young man uh, was in ECMO one year before following cardiac arrest. He finished first in a marath half marathon, not meant for transplant patients, but for general public. So that's the kind of rehabilitation which is possible. So where do we go from here? If you look at the uh, data for the last three years which I collected, the number of organs offered is much more than the number of uh, hearts utilized uh, for all the states. In some of the states, actually, organ utilization is very poor. So while we all read in the literature about organs being short, uh, shortage of organs, that's true in the Western world. At this point in time in India, more organs are available than being utilized. And I hope that situation will change one day. Because of the demographic uh, nature of the Indian donation, I think um, organs will continue to be available because more and more awareness is being created about organ donation. And mainstream cardiologists have not embraced transplantation as a tool, unlike, say, hepatologists and nephrologists. Uh, mainstream cardiologists have not even embraced LVADs as a tool uh, in a significant way. And I think it should happen because it's an important modality to save lives and organs are available and outcomes are actually very, very good. So the conclusions are excellent outcomes are possible in India with five-year survival rates which are comparable to the best published results. With better immune monitoring will lead to more sophisticated immunosuppression, improving long-term outcome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.